certainly like to welcome everyone to the Wednesday night uh, devotional in class. And it's uh, good to have you here. Good to have all the uh, good brethren and sisters spring join in uh, with us. And it's a good opportunity for uh, you know a lot of the men in the congregation to be able to speak about certain topics that they find interesting. And it's just my privilege at this uh, time to be able to present a lesson to you. I, I say it's uh, it's interesting and I, I'd say instructive too to take a word that we use commonly today, and, but also was in common use when Jesus walked the earth. And to examine it, uh, to learn the lessons it uh, may teach us. Now, one word used on several occasions in the New Testament is the word remember. And we could also include its cognates, uh, remembrance, and remind. But, but today, we'll just look at remember. And it's a word uh, in common use today, often used today. Now, a common definition, which I took off the internet, it's defined as to have in or be able to bring to one's mind and an awareness of someone or something that one has seen, known, or experienced in the past. There are other uses of the word, but uh, this definition of service uh, for the nice lesson. Now, all mature and uh, fully functional minds have the capacity to remember past events and also uh, the lessons that are taught by these past events. And whether such minds remember or learn is not always certain. Of course, young people have less to remember. And older people can always remember how much better things were when they were young. Uh, be that as it may, uh, remembering is a useful attribute since it acts as a guide to present actions or attitudes. Let's give a few examples from the uh, New Testament. In Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 11 and 12, it reads there, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ. That's what they're were to remember, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And when they remember these things, they should be thankful that they are now uh, in Christ. But when speaking of the things that would happen to his disciples in John 16, verse 4, Jesus said, but these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. So it's something that you've already experienced. You just want him to remember it. When the disciples misunderstood the warning of Jesus about the uh, leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he asked them if they remembered their miracle of the loaves. You can find that in Mark. 16th chapter in Mark 8, uh, Matthew 16th chapter in Mark 8 chapter. Peter was concerned about the spiritual condition of his brethren as he anticipated his approaching demise. His words recorded in 2 Peter, 1st chapter, verses 10 through 15, are a plea to remember the things he had taught them. It reads there, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do those things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful 
careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Then we come to that verse that is the shortest, second shortest verse in the New Testament. Remember Lot's wife. That's from Luke 17, chapter verse 32. These words spoken by Jesus were part of a response to a query asked by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God would come. <clears throat> now, whether this uh, was a sincere inquiry or merely intended to entrap Jesus, Jesus in his response demolished their misconception of the nature of the kingdom and its appearance. And you can look in the Luke 17, chapter verses 20 through 37. We're not going to read that. In that passage, Jesus said that the kingdom would not come in the manner of earthly kingdoms. People would be carrying on with their daily routines as they were in the days of Noah till he entered the ark. And the floods came and destroyed them all. Likewise, in Sodom, the people did the same thing until Lot went out of Sodom. And it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Most people will be doing the same thing when the Son of Man is revealed. And they will be destroyed or taken up in glory. The Lord said that uh, when that happens, don't concern yourselves with the affairs of this world. It's all over with. Also, there is no longer any opportunity to change. It is in this response that Jesus says to remember Lot's wife. <clears throat> when Jesus says to remember some particular thing, then we ought to pay uh, special attention to the thing impressed upon us to remember. So, exactly what is it we are to remember about Lot's wife? Well, likely it's not some uh, admirable attribute worthy of emulation, but rather something to avoid. The first mention of Lot's wife was in the 19th chapter of Genesis. In fact, the only mention of Lot's wife until Jesus said to remember Lot's wife. And you might just note that Sodom, on the other hand, is mentioned several times in the Bible. Things do not develop in a vacuum, including character and disposition of life. Regardless of how much or little is said about a person, there are things implied from however much or little is said. Now let's consider a few examples. We read in Mark the 12th chapter verses 42 through 44 about one poor widow. Reads there, then one poor widow came and threw in two mites which makes a quadrant. So he, that's Jesus, called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Now we do not know the name of the poor widow nor anything else other than what was said about her by Jesus. Yet there is much implied. She did not just decide on a whim to throw in her two mites. That sacrificial giving characterized her life. She had cultivated, cultivated a mindset of pleasing God with whatever she had, be it little or much, no matter the personal cost to herself. In Acts, the ninth chapter, verses 36 through 42, again, we're not going to read that. There was a certain disciple called Tabitha, translated Dorcas. As the scripture says, she was full of good works and charitable deeds. When she died and Peter went to where her body was laid, the widows attending her stood by weeping, showing the tunics and garments that Dorcas had made. 
the uh, display of these garments by these widows was indication that Dorcas was in the habit of providing for needy widows. Her assistance to those in need was characteristic of her life. Nothing more is said about her, but she has been memorialized in scripture for eternity for her good deeds. More examples could be given, such as Mary and Martha, the virtuous wife of Proverbs 31, Daniel and his three companions, Hannah, and so many more. Then we have Lot's wife. We know little about her. She is first mentioned in Genesis 19, chapter verse 15, when Lot was instructed to take his wife and two daughters and flee the city of Sodom, which was about to be destroyed. The angel strictly warned those who fled the impending destruction of the city not to look back. But Lot's wife did look back and consequently was turned into a pillar of salt. Scripture does not tell us her name or when she became Lot's wife. It is not said if she came from Lot's kinsmen or from one of the heathen nations. But we do know she had been Lot's wife long enough for them to have two married daughters. Therefore, we could say with confidence that she came under the influence of Lot. Whether that influence had its desired effect is conjectural, though unlikely. Events, of course, are a powerful commentary. So what about Lot? Uh, the Apostle Peter, as recorded in Second Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, mentions righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Yet as tormented as he was by the depravity of the citizens of Sodom, he still lived among them. He could have remained with his uncle Abraham and, and avoided the evil influences of that city. As vexed as he was, he chose to remain there. Maybe the hardships of living in tents did not appeal to him, or perhaps he was just not appealing to his wife. After all, she was the one that looked back, not him. It is a reminder that we cannot make friends with evil and expect to remain unaffected. We are in the world exposed to its influences. But as the apostle Paul wrote, therefore come out from among them and be, be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. That comes from 2 Corinthians 6, chapter verse 17. When Lot and Abraham separated, Lot pitched his, his tent as far as Sodom. We find that in Genesis, the 13th chapter, verse 12. It came to pass that after a battle by certain kings against Sodom and Gomorrah, that Lot was taken captive. He was rescued by Abraham. After his rescue, Lot returned to Sodom, the very place that vexed his soul. Why did he return to a place that made him unhappy? The scriptural account does not say. So it was in this context that Lot's wife lived, which likely unduly influenced her response to the instructions of the angel. Remember, we are not to follow man, but Jesus Christ. But didn't Paul say it to imitate him? Well, yes, he did. As recorded in 1 Corinthians 11, chapter verse 1, he said, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. King James Version reads, Be you followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. This is a, an imperative that looks uh, through Paul to Christ. So ultimately, that is the one whom we are to imitate and follow. But the text says, remember Lot's wife. It does not say, remember Lot. 
when the time for separation arrived, Lot's wife could not tear herself away from the world. By her actions, she demonstrated that she loved worldly things and delighted in them. And although associated with a gracious man when the time came for a decision, she betrayed her true character. Flight without so much as looking back was demanded of them, but this was too much for her. She did look back and thus prove that she had sufficient presumption in her heart to defy God's command and risk her all to give a lingering love glance at the condemned and guilty world. It was by that glance that she perished. Now, and it's, we have to acknowledge that Lot's wife obeyed the instructions of the angel, most she prepared herself to leave the city with Lot and daughters. She ran through the streets and passed the city gates. She reached the open plain along with her husband and daughters. She was really willing to run with them and did so for a considerable distance. That is, until she thought over what she was doing and considered what she was leaving. Then her pace slackened and she lingered behind. She did go part of the way to safety, and yet she perished. So let us remember that partial obedience is unacceptable to God. He has done all that he can to secure our salvation, but he cannot do what we must do ourselves. Remember that the angel grabbed Lot, his wife, and his daughters, and led them out of the city. They were told to flee and not look back. That was all that could be done. The angel could not overcome Lot's wife's longing glance back at the life she was leaving. She was almost saved, but not quite. We read in the synoptic gospel accounts about the so-called rich and young ruler. He asked Jesus what good thing must he do to inherit eternal life. And uh, Jesus, of course, told him to keep the commandments. And according to the rich young ruler, he kept all the commandments. He then asked Jesus what he lacked that he may have eternal life. Now, Jesus got right down to brass tacks and told him to sell what he had and come follow him. The rich young ruler would not give up his riches. Almost saved, but not quite. Lot's wife, like the rich young ruler, loved something she just could not give up. Once we have rendered obedience to the gospel, we are declaring that we are walking by faith and not by sight. We are promised to know that we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We cannot have divided loyalties and be acceptable to our Heavenly Father. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. We have learned from numerous prior studies uh, and lessons that God will always punish sin. And each of us should thank God daily that Christ went to the cross and shed his blood, giving us all the opportunity and the invitation to have our sins washed away. Lot's wife obeyed the commandment to flee the city, but disobeyed the commandment to not look back. Why was she not given the opportunity to reach the safety of, of Zoar? After all, she fled the city unlike her sons-in-law, looking back was just one little indiscretion. But she was given that opportunity. She had received the angels into in, her house. She had seen them strike with blindness the wicked mob at her door. She had heard the majestic words of persuasion 
and was and was entreated by their kind compulsion. She had plenty of evidence that this message was from God. But she doubted the truth of a, of a message clearly from God. And she suffered the faith <clears throat> that awaits all who reject God. Her looking back longingly at what she was leaving was a testament to her disposition of mind. It was not a one-off failure, but was cultivated over a lifetime. That same faith awaits mankind today who, refusing the gospel's call, choose to live a life of disobedience. Like Lot's wife, perseverance and disobedience will cause one to perish. Loving the world is no better than loving a pillar of salt. Lot's wife looked back because she loved Sodom and the things she was leaving there. Even the destruction of the cities of the plain did not extinguish her love of the life she was leaving behind. The fact is, she was not leaving it behind, but had treasured it in her heart. In 1 John, the, se uh, the second chapter, verses six, uh, 15 and 17, uh, through 17, we read, <clears throat> Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world was passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides, abides forever. For well, she loved the world and the things in the world. Therefore, the love of the Father was not in her. When Jesus was asked by a lawyer of the Pharisees what was the greatest commandment in the law, he replied as follows. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That comes from Matthew 22, chapter verses 37 through 40. Lot's wife did not have the Lord God. did not love the Lord God with all her heart, soul, and mind. <clears throat> there is also the love of worldly Sodom, an incompatibility that God will not tolerate. That was the reason that Paul condemned Demas for forsaking him, noting that Demas loved this present world, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. We can speculate what would have been the fate of Lot's wife had he not moved his family, family to Sodom. Her fate, however, was determined by her heart, which gave rise to disobedience. If not here, it would have been at some later time. Circumstances may have been different, but the outcome would have been the same. <clears throat> what in summary are some of the lessons we can learn from Lot's wife? We've already mentioned some, so if I repeat myself, <clears throat> it's so that you remember those lessons you already know. Always be prepared. As previously noted in the section of scripture from which our passage is taken, <clears throat> when the end of the world comes, it is too late to make any changes. You are what you are. As Paul wrote in, wrote in 2 Corinthians 6, chapter verse 2, where he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you, Behold, now is the accepted time, and behold, now is the day of salvation. <clears throat> Even Jesus was urgent in his approach to his own work. He said that I must work the works of him <clears throat> who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Come from John the ninth chapter verse four. Obedient is an is an urgent matter. It should not be treated with indifference. There is no such thing as an insignificant disobedience or a small sin. True, some sins impact others less or more than other sins. 
man may characterize one sin as horrific, but another as insignificant. Not so with God. All sin is offensive to him, and God will always punish disobedience. Sin cannot be ignored. <clears throat> the gospel contains God's means of saving mankind. Uh, Romans uh, 1st chapter verse 16. We read in 2nd Samuel 24th chapter, in the 21st chapter of 1st Chronicles, that David numbered the people contrary to the command of God. David repented of this sin, and apparently no harm resulted directly from the numbering. Nevertheless, God still punished him. God gave three choices as punishment, but David had repented of the sin, and apparently no harm had resulted from the numbering. But it was sin, and God, being just, had to punish David. There is no such thing as insignificant obedience. When God spoke to the multitudes and disciples, as recorded in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, he excoriated the scribes and Pharisees for their many failures. In verse 23, we read his saying, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe and mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Jesus is saying to obey in small matters as well as in, as in the weighty matters. Now, obedience by its very nature is weighty and urgent. Sin can affect others who have not engaged in the sin. In Joshua, the seventh chapter, verses 1 through 26, which we're not going to read, we read of the sin of Achan, who took some of the forbidden things from the city of Jericho. The subsequent attack on Ai resulted in a bitter defeat. Others died because of Achan's sin. That's the very nature of sin. Its effects simply cannot be isolated. We live in an interconnected world. What we do, good or bad, affects others who may be completely involved in a good deed or the act of disobedience. Love of the world will always lead to backsliding. Lot's wife loved Sodom and the things that it offered. She just couldn't let go of it. In 1 John, the second chapter, verse 15 through 17, we're told not to love the world or things in the world. If anyone that loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. As mentioned, loving the world was the reason that Demas forsook Paul. Salvation and sanctification are strictly personal. You cannot be saved by proxy or by another's good works. Salvation cannot be passed from one person to another. Because your parents are saved doesn't mean you are saved. Lot's wife could not be saved by the obedience of Lot. She had the same offer of salvation from destruction as did Lot, his daughters, and for that matter, his uh, sons-in-law. Yet she perished. We all come from different backgrounds. We have different histories. Yet we have a common hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, Titus First chapter, verse 2. But we must not, as did Lot's wife, look back at the old life of sin. As Paul said in Philippians, the third chapter, verses 12 through 14, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself have apprehended but one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead I press towards a goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus so then let us forget those things that are behind and reach forward to those things which are ahead but always remember 
Lot's wife. Thank you for your kind attention. I hope it's been a useful uh, lesson for you.